I'm uh, Susan Olson Davis. I'm the co-chair of the Women's Committee. And I'm Christiana Miller. I'm the other co-chair of the Women's Committee. And we want to point out our uh, DGA Women's Committee counterparts who also were instrumental in putting this panel together. We have Sandra Milliner. Hi. We have Donna Parrish. Hi. Janice Cook. And Tanya McKiernan, who's at a wedding, we've been told. <laughs> also, we'd like to thank our staff liaisons without whom we could do nothing. Seriously, they are the backbone of everything that goes on in both the DGA and the WGA. So, um, Kim Myers and Terry Lopez from the WGA. <laughs> and Regina Render and Patty Lake from the DGA. And we also just want to mention that this is a pretty groundbreaking event. This is the first collaboration of this type for the WGA and the DGA. And it's been over a year in the making. Yeah. Um, also, we are going to be passing around cards for you to write questions that we're going to be collecting. Um, Maria Rodriguez, right here, will be collecting questions, as well as Lauren. Where is Lauren? Lauren will also be collecting questions from you, which we will then give to Angela to uh, ask towards the end of the discussion. Right, so if you need a card or if you have a question that needs to be collected, um, raise your hand so that they can see you. Okay, great. So we'll begin, and I want to introduce everyone to Angela Robinson, our moderator. She's an incredible writer-director, so she's been on both sides, so she's perfect for this panel. Um, and Angela received a BA in theater from Brown University and her MFA from NYU grad filmmaking program. She started in theater in New York, working at Playwrights Horizons, Second Stage, and Here. Angela then moved to LA and made a short film called Debs, which was then financed as a feature film for Sony's Screen Gems. She directed Herbie, fully loaded for Disney, was a co-EP on The L Word and Hung, and is currently a co-EP on True Blood. And she's also, if she's not busy enough, writing a teen thriller for Paramount. She created the web series Girl Trash, which we all need to check out. You'll have to tell us how to find it. Um, oh, Google. You can Google it. Okay, you can Google it. Um, and she recently made a foray into comic books, a graphic novel of Girl Trash, will be released by Random House in 2013. Okay, one of our WGA panelists, Michelle King. The Emmy-nominated writing team of Robert and Michelle King have been creative collaborators for over a decade, and they've been married for over two decades. So. Hallelujah. <laughs> Their critically adored drama, The Good Wife, starring Emmy and Golden Globe Award winning actress Juliana Margulies, premiered in the fall of 2009 on CBS to critical and popular acclaim. They previously created the 2006 ABC drama about the wrongly accused and imprisoned Injustice, st um, which starred Kyle McLaughlin from Desperate Housewives and Jason O'Mara from Terra Nova. Prior to their work in television, Michelle worked in development at various studios and production companies while Robert wrote a dozen produced feature films, including the mountain climbing action feature Vertical Limit starring Chris O'Donnell and Red Corner starring Richard Gere. For the work on The Good Wife, Robert and Michelle have been honored by their peers with recognition from the WGA and the Academy of Television Arts and Sciences as well as the Television Critics Association. In addition to creative recognition, the Kings have been awarded the Sidney Lumet Award for Integrity in Entertainment, the Humanitas Prize and the prestigious Peabody Award and are my personal heroes. <laughs> and next up we have uh, the writing team of Nicole Yorkin and Don Presswich, if you don't mind raising your hands. There we go. Um, Nicole and Dawn have recently served as co-EPs on the first two seasons of The Killing on AMC. So uh, they, you probably want to hit them up about the uh, season finale. <laughs> um, before that, they were consulting producers on ABC's Flash Forward, coming off of a two-year stint as writer, writers and executive producer showrunners of, F, of FX's The Riches. In 2007, they served as consulting producers of FX's Dirt. Prior to that, they were co-EPs on Showtime's Brotherhood, HBO's Carnival, and CBS's Judging Amy. 
In 2003, they won a Writers Guild Award for their drama pilot, The Education of Max Bixford. Yorkin and Presswich have worked on various television shows over 15 years, including Picket Fences, The Practice, Ally McBeal, and they shared an Emmy nomination along with several producers of Chicago Hope for outstanding drama series. Before going into television, Yorkin, a Berkeley graduate, was a reporter for the LA Herald Examiner, where she was nominated for a Pulitzer Prize for a series of articles about a 12-year-old prostitute. Presswich, a Texas native who escaped the heat to attend Stanford University, was a published short story writer before she and Yorkin met at AFI. Nicole and Dom. Now we'll do our DGA panelists, and we have Leslie Linka Gladder right here in the blue, the lovely blue. <laughs> <laughs> Leslie is also a, a board member of the DGA. Uh, Leslie began her directing career through AFI's directing workshop for women. Her first short film, Tales of Meeting and Parting, was nominated for an Academy Award. Gladder made her feature film directorial debut with New Line's successful coming-of-age comedy, Now and Then, featuring Demi Moore, Melanie Griffith, Rosie O'Donnell, and Christina Ricci. She also directed HBO's State of Emergency, which received a Cable Ace nomination for Best Picture, as well as a nomination for the Humanitas Award. Her other HBO films include Into the Homeland and The Promise. Gladder also directed the romantic period drama The Proposition, starring Kenneth Branagh, Madeline Stowe, and William Hurt. She is slated to direct the new Regency film Bell of the Ball. Leslie's first series was Twin Peaks, which I know there's a lot of Twin Peaks fans out here. I've already been talking to a few people. Um, where she received her first DGA Award nomination. Since then, she has directed many episodes, including multiple episodes of West Wing, ER, Freaks and Geeks, NYPD Blue, House, The Mentalist, Weeds, and The Good Wife. Le yeah. <laughs> I think you have the career of five people. <laughs> um, Leslie was nominated for an Emmy for directing Mad Men and won the DGA Award for the same episode. Most recently, she directed Aaron Sorkin's new series for HBO, The Newsroom, also Boss for Stars, and is currently in prep on her third True Blood episode, which she is doing with Angela. They're actually in the midst of it right now. Yeah. Then, after that, you go on to Homeland and The Walking Dead. Um, her pilots that she's directed include The Gilmore Girls and Pretty Little Liars. Uh, as well, Leslie was the co-EP on the Sean Ryan series, The Chicago Code. Welcome, Leslie. <laughs> Okay, next we have a woman after my heart, which is Gwyneth Horder Payton, a fellow horsewoman. Yay! <laughs> Gwyneth worked as an assistant director for 20 years before moving up to director on The Shield. She has since directed Battlestar Galactica, Sons of Anarchy, The Walking Dead, The Killing, Justified, Touched, so, sorry, Touch, Once Upon a Time, and Longmire, among many other shows. This summer, she will be shooting a six-hour documentary called The California Mission Ride about the influence of the Spanish missions on California history. This will be filmed as she and six assorted characters ride their horses from the northernmost Sonoma mission to the southernmost San San Diego mission, staying at all 19 missions between. That sounds awesome. Okay. <laughs> Gwyneth lives in Santa Cruz with her husband and two children, and in her spare time, she rides her horse. <laughs> oh and last but not least, we have Rosemary Rodriguez right here. Uh, Rosemary directed the feature film uh, Acts of Worship that premiered at the Sundance Film Festival and went on to the Independent Spirit Award nominations, including the John, oh, sorry, Casavetes? Uh, okay, award, sorry, for best feature. I'm a writer. <laughs> <laughs> um, she was accepted into John Wells production, uh, Productions' Women Minority Fellowship, which led to directing two episodes of Third Watch. Rosemary was the first woman director to direct Dennis Leary's Rescue Me. Three episodes of that. We'd probably like to hear some stories about that. <laughs> um, other shows include The Good Wife, I Just Want My Pants Back, Law and Order, SVU, Castle, Without a Trace, Hawthorne, and Blue Bloods. 
The Lifetime movie she directed, The Pregnancy Pact, was the highest rated of any Lifetime movie in their history. Currently, Rosemary is working on her feature films, Loose Girl and Joe, produced by uh, Carrie Orent. She is also producing Kevin Estrada's Growing Up Metal with Fred Roos. Rosemary is married to comedian Nestor Rodriguez, who keeps her laughing through all the crap. <laughs> we were, it's been censored. <laughs> all the crap. <laughs> oh. All right, so, so now again, and if you have questions, be sure to just raise your hand with the question on your card, and then um, Lauren or Maria will pick that up from you, and we're going to turn over the panel to Angela. All right. Oh. <laughs> Thanks, everybody, for waking up on a Saturday. Uh, this is an insanely rad panel. <laughs> Sometimes you get bum panels, because I'm, <laughs> but this is a great it's already a great panel. So, um, and I've kind of worn many hats. So I was thinking about this. This panel's about collaborating between writers and directors. Um, and I guess I just wanted to start with, I think, wait, wait, let me just get a, my bearings here. Like, how many people are interested in the writing angle of it? Show of hands. Writers, writers, writers. And how many on the directing? Oh, 50-50, rats. Okay. Awesome. WGA, TGA, synergy. Um, uh, okay, so I think that there, it's my personal belief, and everybody contradict me or not, that um, there's a fundamental misunderstanding of the relationship between the writer and the director in television. Because most people come from film school and directing features, which is a very kind of autonomous thing and then then get hired into television and then a lot of problems arrive because um, it's just a different relationship. So I'm just going to toss it out. I won't call on names. But I was hoping that you guys could speak to what you think the core relationship between a television director and writer is. Yeah. OK, I'll just say. I think it's extremely collaborative. Mm -hmm. You know, in, in our experience, like 20 years in television, um, <clears throat> in the best instances, it's um, like the symbiosis between the writer and the director. And um, I think what you're talking about is it's not as if the director is king on a, or queen on a TV set. Um, you know, it's, it tends to be more of the writer or the writer producer who's there consistently. But um, in the best situations, you have this great collaboration between a writer and a director, and it feels very equal and very even. And just to be completely sexist, I'll say that I think women are just sort of naturally better at this. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. 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 I think that um, just to follow up, Nicole, because this is what we do. <laughs> but, um, I think I think that um, I agree with her completely. It, it, we have we some of, some of our best collaborations have been with with women with Gwyneth. We've worked with Gwyneth twice now, but um, it's it's really uh, it's really a hard job to be a director in television, because and I don't want to say especially on a show like The Killing, but. On a show like The Killing, there's an expectation that you come, you, that you you must come to that show with with a lot of talent and vision as a director, and yet you still have to figure out what is the show. So you have to be consistent with the show, and there's but there's still an expectation that you will still elevate it, and that is a hard line to walk, a really hard line to walk, and I think that. Um, that's why the collaboration is so essential, too, because the writer just wants the director to be able to do that and you know, protect the director so that the director can have their vision, but at the same time, they can, you know, they can understand sort of this is what the show. And, and the show, you have to learn the show as the show goes. And so it's, it's all constantly evolving. So yeah. I have to say, I think that that's a great statement because as a director, we want to come in and do the best possible job that we can do. And the writer is our collaborator, our key collaborator. So the fact that there's any dissension between writers and directors, the, the, we are our partners. We need each other. Absolutely. We have different skill sets. And when you go into a show, um, yes, you want to know what the show is you're going into, but you also want to bring who you are and what you are. And I feel like 
you know, I come out of theater and dance. The writer, I mean, that's, that's everything, that, that connection. So the fact that there's been any discussion that it should be contrary, that we're on different teams, we're the team. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So that's what it's about, you know, is we all have different skills, and, and that's what we bring to the party. You know? I, I think what aids in a collaboration, too, in television is the ability, the directors come back. I mean, the first time you're lucky if it works, but then the second or the third or the fourth time that a director is coming on to a show, there's that trust. So then there is, uh, I think, far more collaboration and, and a, a familiarity with the show and the so familiarity true. with the people involved. That's when it, I, from, in my opinion, really starts clicking and really works best. Right. It's amazing the first time when you have that with a writer. You know, where it's all like, oh my goodness, you're totally speaking the same language. And it's really exciting. But when you, when you come back again, you know, and you know all the players, it's mm -hmm. like, wow, you're coming back to a family. Yeah. I think it's all trust is, is key. Um, and especially um, in the first episode where... <laughs> not See, we're collaborating. <laughs> hello, hello, hello. 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 Oh, no, it isn't. Okay, um, it's it's good when you uh, trust is actually developed right away, or not even developed, but it's you come in with trust for the person that you've hired. Yeah. So it's wonderful when the the writers are able to trust the director that they've hired or helped to hire, and that the um, the director immediately you know I tr um, embraces the script as something that's that's wonderful, and they try to make it work as best as possible, as opposed to going in and, and suggesting changes, at least that's how I, <laughs> yeah. I, I yeah. go about it. Yeah. Um, there's always a way to make it work. Yeah. Yeah. What were you going to say? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> go ahead. No, no, go. Go ahead. You have to go, Rush. <laughs> you go. I call. I'm the moderator. I'm going to say something. I'm going to say something. No, I was, I was just going to say, um, <laughs> Okay. Um, that I think a lot of it has to do um, the coming back to another show is certainly helpful because you get to know the politics of the show and I think what what is sort of the white elephant everywhere especially being a director going place to place to place is is the politics mm -hmm. and, and the, the setup of the people mm -hmm. and you're a guest and you walk in and you don't really know what that is and mm -hmm. what that entails so you're not sure the hierarchy of like okay I have this idea and because sometimes I think what happens to me as a director I, I feel like people not here, which is why I love being here on The Good Life, um, but other shows, it's like you go and they don't really understand that you're there to elevate, to serve them, to make them happy, and to like do something maybe they haven't thought of at the same time. You know, so that's a real collaboration. I think sometimes it's like you're hired, it's like, oh, just go and do this. Or, you know, I've literally, it's just the politics are difficult to navigate sometimes. And I think sometimes because we're not seen as collaborators. Mm -hmm. We're seen as like a person for hire mm -hmm. who's right, just that's there. True. And, and I think when somebody runs a show and they actually are looking for collaboration, right. then then it's, it's easy. Then yeah. it's exciting and it's fun. And when it's not, then I don't really want to go back to no, that show. Same. <laughs> but the other thing is the writing producer, the showrunner create gets to create the world that we go into. And you get to create it in your own, the way you want it to be. It can be wonderful and harmonious and collaborative, or it can be toxic and backbiting. <laughs> I mean, I've, I've been in both, you know, and it's a choice. Mm. You know, like for me, it, there's no question, you know, if it's the toxic version, I'm not going back there like it's too short. But I am going to bring up something that probably <laughs> is, uh, you know, I've, I feel very lucky, knock on wood, I've had amazing relationships with writers. But a few times, and the shows will be nameless, <laughs> that I've been on something, and as a, as a guest director, if you come in and you get a really shitty script, and sometimes it happens, yeah. you know, and, you know, I'll go in and obviously ask a lot of questions to try to help make it better. But if they, if the people involved don't want to know, you are never coming back. And mm -hmm. that's the truth. Like, if you yeah. get the turkey, and sometimes when you're doing 24 shows, that's a tall order. Something's going to, you know, show 18, man. So, somewhere in there. So, so if there's a problem, and there, we're problem solvers, we want to make it better, you know. So, if you can go in together and say, okay, we've got to make this work, you know, you can have a great experience. But if 
that happens. So that's why I was kind of laughing. Because if you do get that episode, there's no saving it. There's no saving <laughs> yeah. it. And I just yeah. want to say, yes, your director usually gets blamed. Totally. Yes. Totally. Yeah. <laughs> but on the flip side, I've gotten really, really bad scripts that nobody wants to deal with, literally. Like, yes. it's like, oh, will you meet with me? Yeah, I'll meet you at, like, 10, 10 o'clock next morning when the door's locked. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, oh, everybody. Guys, we experience that. But at the same time, when something's really bad, then there's a point where that can be an asset totally. for me, where I get to do something with it. And everyone's expectations are so low that it's like, wow. Like, <laughs> <laughs> it's here that works. Wow. So it, can be, it can be, yes, too. absolutely. But, but I just want the directors here to know that, um, like, we've been responsible for, for training a lot of up and coming writers on sets. And there is a certain set etiquette, yes. which we believe in, and maybe not everybody, mm -hmm. you know, upholds, which is that you, as a writer or a writing producer or somebody sitting on the set, do not go and talk to the actors. Mm -hmm. I mean, if they come to you and ask you a question, you can answer, but you are not the director, yeah. right? So, um, and I've, I've actually seen inexperienced writers sitting, you know, actually just sitting next to the director, like directing basically, yeah. and <laughs> and talking to actors, and it's really, I know it's probably a DGA violation too, but. Um, it's also stupid. Yeah. yeah. Because, you know, as, as a writer, you may have the, it in your head, what it's supposed to be, you may you may have that in your head, but but you are not a director. Usually, <laughs> so so you you need to let the director do what they're doing. I mean, do their skill. Otherwise, if you and what we what we have seen is we've seen writers sort of step on directors like that and try to control them so much that that director is so squelched and so confused by the end that they can't bring any of their personal vision to it. So. And you know, course, we are well aware yeah. how, how the whole system can screw up an episode. And of course, you know? if there's a problem, as a writer, you see that the director's not getting you know, the, the notion of the script, even though you've gone over it many times, or the actor is not getting it, then you can talk to the director you know, as part of your collaboration, just say, you know, I don't think they're quite getting the anger we need, or whatever it is. Yeah. And they'll listen to you if you have a good relationship, yeah. you know, and they'll go try and do it again. So. Um, it's also a matter of one voice thing for the yeah. actors, so you don't yeah. confuse yes. the actors. Um, and these guys have it; they have it down. So it's it's also a matter of timing. So if there is a, a yeah. question or a, a you know a thought that they yeah. have, that wait till the director does it several times and then come in and very quietly yeah. say something. Right, and don't make a big show of it. <laughs> don't stand there behind the uh, the monitor going no. <laughs> <laughs> Never good. Never good. <laughs> but we actually have seen, even recently, a, sort of an inexperienced writer dealing with, I believe, an Emmy Award winning director, and just, they, you know, that setup's not going to work. Talking about setups, talking, oh, yeah. <laughs> and, and, you know, that's not what we thought, and that's not what we expected, and, and then the director finally just had to say, which one of us has the DGA card? <laughs> <laughs> it was not a good no, that's collaboration. Like the, the worst case scenario. And it was not women. <laughs> Can that's, I just true. Say? <laughs> that's true. <laughs> it's true. And I was thinking, in, as a writer, I think it's something that you. It's interesting because I've been on both sides of the thing. So yeah. I actually have to work very hard to kind of keep my writer hat on and not like suggest shots or things or something, but I also know how friggin' irritating it is to be trying to make your day and that you have, it's an evolution with the actors. Do you know what I mean? Like it may not happen on the first take and you have your process and you're a director and for people to start like nitpicking you like after take one and you're just like, Dah! Yeah, you know, like, <laughs> here's the thing, if I give them that note now, then they're going to freak out, and then they're going to fight me the rest of the day, and yeah. like, so, I mean, there's like a method to the madness, and if, as a writer, if you, you have to kind of let go of the episode at some point, do you know what I mean? And I feel like, and let people collaborate and add to it, and... As a director, you're just your eye is just on that episode, which is great. You know, I mean, like when you're on a writer, you're you're on the whole season. You're like, oh shit, I have to set that up for the next episode, and you're kind of your brain is like holistic. But the writer, I mean, the director comes in and they're just fighting really hard for that episode. Do you know what I mean? So they're focusing on things that you're not, you know, 
I don't know, you're just, or you've been through like eight zillion versions. Do you know what I mean? You're like, yeah. okay, so then when Eric did that, no, no, that's not what we landed on, you know? Like, so, yeah. and then there's like, you know, and so they're coming with outside eyes to kind of really look at it, which is an amazing thing. But I feel like if you're insecure as a writer and you can't hear feedback, then that can be a very threatening scenario yeah, but if you yeah. just kind of like yeah, yeah let I it go I think that's true as an insecure director as well I, I think mean, you're oh, wait, yeah. is your thing on Hi. so everybody make sure that they're because these three may be off and really on. Okay. yeah we're on Loud. we're being silenced <laughs> I, I'm tone deaf so I promise I won't sing <laughs> <laughs> the deal is we also oh, pick thank you oh there's a t on button oh that <laughs> Okay. Um, the, the other thing is we all picked being in a collaborative medium. We picked in, being in a team sport. So for me, the best idea wins, you know. And, and, you know, if the craft service guy has a good idea, bring it on, you know. He, and if it doesn't work, he's going to put out great food, you know. <laughs> so, so the bottom line is you need, as I think as a director or a writer, you need to know what you want, but you need to know if there's a better idea because it's only going to make me look better in the long run. And that's the fun of it. The fun is, you know, yes, you have a vision and then you can, you have these other, you know, amazingly talented people with very specific skills to make it better. How cool is that, that this is what we get to do with a team? I mean, we're not poets sitting in a room alone. You know, we get to play with a hundred <laughs> people on a set, you know, who are very talented. That is like unbelievable. Yeah, it goes back to like high school when we were all putting on the show. Yes, you know? exactly. It's like, isn't that where it all begins? You know, and we're all like, I like that. Yeah. You know, <laughs> it's like we're all putting on the show. It doesn't have to be mine. Yeah. You know, it's, it's but, you know. I think at the end of the day, it's always, it, if people remember, it's always about the show. Yes. Yeah. And then like right. that we come into it, it's about the show. Like right. I, I don't show up anywhere without doing a lot of homework, as, exactly. as, as we all do. Yeah. And so you already, sometimes I think people don't know, you know, that, oh, she's actually studied, she knows, like, and that at the end of the day, it is about the episode. All the questions we're asking and all of the things that we're trying to bring up, it's, it's because we want the show to be great. And there are a lot of times when there's a whole, there are questions that, well, what's coming next that I want to know because it informs that episode. Sure. Because I know what's led up to it. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Anyway. Um, but isn't it wonderful when that does happen? Um, but we're not in completely in charge of or in control of, of, have, of, of setting that atmosphere where um, there's no power struggle and all ideas are good, as much as I'd like to say. Yeah. That we, we, we have an, a huge influence in setting that scenario, but sometimes there are other people in the, uh, in the team that um, are not about that. So it's, it's a wonderful thing when it all like works. Shut up right. and do your job. But then we also, yeah. <laughs> you have to figure out how to work with someone difficult. That's yeah. part of the yes. job too, whether it's an actor or, or a, a DP. DP or right. I mean, it's, yeah. it's part of how can you make that an opportunity? Yeah. How can you, you know, and sometimes it's a challenge. How can I figure out how to get to that person? Yeah. You know, and you, we have to deal with all situations, the great ones and the ones that are more difficult too. And, and sometimes we have to play games with the people who can't let go of that and sort of say that's a great idea, even though you don't think it is. <laughs> <laughs> given that, and yeah. then the next time you, maybe you get it. You know? Yeah, yeah. I was wondering if we could speak to it because, yeah. like Rosemary, you alluded to the politics, but I was wondering just for some specifics, and it doesn't have to, you know, shows unnamed or whatever. But what is a real cluster you found yourself in? Do you know what I mean? Like a really or I can a horror give story? You a story about the first episode <laughs> I ever did. Yeah. Great. Because um, the show's gone. It doesn't matter who did it. Um, there was. A, the first, the, the script that I read first was great, and then it sort of changed. And then the person, you know, so lots of times the shows where the showrunner sort of rewrites everyone's stuff anyway, right? So, so what happened was those, the writers are in LA, everyone's in New York. The writer that wrote my episode was, was in New York and with me. So I had the showrunner giving me notes telling me, no, I've been telling her this, da 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 Like, I don't know why this isn't coming through. And that's my first episode. So this is a showrunner telling me and asking me to give the note to the writer of the script, who's there uh. in the So me, I'm like, OK, I know that's a little sketchy. I mean, I'm not stupid. But at the same time, it's, it's what needs to happen. 
not because of, I want to serve him, but because it's right for the story. So I'm like, and it was, anyway. So I had to find a way to go to her and sort of make it like, hey, I was just asking these questions and it happened to come up and it happened to be, and you know, did it, and I did it like that. And she saw right through it. <laughs> <laughs> so and it was a nightmare. <laughs> it, was, it was an acting problem. That's why I'm behind the camera. Um, but anyway, it was a huge lesson positive. So then I felt terrible. And then I, the next day I came in. But I figured it's all going to get resolved. The next day I came in, the, the, one of the producers like called me in into his office. And he's like, you fucked up. Da -da -da -da, for real. Started yelling at me. I'm like, what? And it's like, oh my god. I realized that I was put in the middle of a political situation that was mm -hmm ongoing mm -hmm. that I had no knowledge of and so all I could do was then go and apologize I called LA sorry blah, blah blah even though I didn't feel like I needed to I did anyway I said I'm sorry I didn't mean to create any confusion talk to the writer but she never got back on board with me so it was difficult but I fought for that script anyway mm -hmm. and it all worked out really well and the episode came because I knew it was my first one right. it's like my first one out of the box if I fail yeah. at this I'm screwed <laughs> so that was part of the stakes were high for me but um that was a huge lesson and the night before we were um going i was going to start shooting the night before and perhaps she came into my office and she sat across from me and she said this is the worst experience in television <gasps> i've ever had oh, and i was really like awesome. wow confidence yeah. builder yeah, so I left there and I was like, wow, no wonder why this happens to her. Because that's not even a good thing to say to anybody. No. Like, yeah. I mean, in the big picture, I'm like, wow. So there was a lot of politics right out of the box for me. And anyway, the episode was, a, was really successful, though. <laughs> Yay. Uh, I had a similar story where I once went on a show. And I didn't know, but there was a feud like a full force feud yeah. going on between the cast and the showrunners, just <laughs> hardcore, where they almost weren't speaking. And I was like, da da da, so happy to be here. <laughs> like, hey, <laughs> let's do this. Love you guys, love the show. And then I was like, and I didn't know, like my office was kind of like in the back and it had gotten to such a point that the <laughs> actors wouldn't cross paths, like they wouldn't walk past the show or the office because they were so mad. <laughs> and um, and then I got summoned basically by one of the stars and I didn't know. I was like, do 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 like you know and I went in there and I was like, oh my God, I'm so excited to work with you and blah blah blah. And she said, You've certainly been handed a shit sandwich and I was like <laughs> Whoa, you know, <laughs> that you like, and then I realized it totally inadvertently, like, and I want to be like, start the show, whatever, you know, like, I wanted to, you know, and then they started kind of downloading, like, every grievance they'd had for, like, the last four years. I mean, I mean you're on a show for, like, a long time. It's like, they store up, you know, <laughs> season after season, and so, and then I got, and I, but I just had to be like, well, I'm sure it's great. And the sh I mean, like, what do you, s you can't say anything. You can't be like, yeah, that really sucked. And I totally get, like, you can't because that's no good. So, and then I got called in to the showrunners the next day being like, what did they tell you? And I was like, uh. <laughs> uh, and I was like, it's no big deal, it's fine. They were just little, I just, you know, calm them down. But they were like, no, it's your job to tell me what they told you. Oh, oh no. And I'm like, and then I was like, I really feel like that was in confidence, but I'll totally lose the confidence of all of the actors. Like, if I'm. Now the, like, you know, I was just like, I called my agent, I was like, get me out of here, like, I don't know, totally, like, what do I do, you know, and it was this weird thing where, like, in this ongo, I just, like, it was like a landmine, and I would inadvertently, and it was really difficult because um, children really wanted me to help them, and they were like, it's your job to help me with the cast, and then I was like, it's, but it's my job as a director, I was like, for the episode, I really feel like it's best, like, the, if I get in the middle of that or betray those confidences, then the cast will turn on me when I'm directing them and the episode will be bad. And I, just as with my hat on now as a director, I have to make the, the episode good. You know, like, I don't know from all of this. I don't know who's right, who's <laughs> wrong. I, I'm just trying to figure out how to get the best result out of the situation. But it was hairy. And then I was just like, you know. 
And actually, the EP totally helped me out on that one, where I was just like, I went to them, and I was just like, I don't know what I stepped into. And she did this like crazy bit of showmanship that was awesome. And what like, and then do? we just went in. Um, she basically, <laughs> this is so weird. Do you know what I mean? Like, she, it was building to a crisis, and she literally like sent some people out of town. Do you know what I mean? Like she sent them home, like she just like got plane tickets and like moved. Like she just, I mean it was it was just like a technical fix where she was like, if we can, they just had to make it through like three more episodes too. Do you know what I mean? So it was kind of like, and, and then actually, you know, avoiding the blow up. So she literally like, moved people's flights up and like shifted things around and then they just didn't it's like if they didn't get in a fight then then it just like everybody calmed down you know and then diffused. it just diffused it and went it was literally like a genius move i was like because they didn't really want that fight ultimately do you know, like it get crazy late in the season you know and so she actually just diffused it by literally shipping people away <laughs> and then um and then it was fine and then everybody like loved each other like two months later so what do you do like you know <laughs> so i have a horror story yes <laughs> literally <laughs> I, mean, I didn't. I you, didn't okay. fix it. So I'm going to contradict That's myself. An, uh, and say, I approached it. I approached it um, with the. Um, I, uh, my approach was that you can make it work. Somehow you can make this work. Okay. Um, and partly that comes from my AD background. You know, mm. any you can anything. You, you got to make it work. So do, come up with something. And if you don't approach it like that, then you're just going to fail anyway. So I was given a script that I that everybody well most people embraced and and I did I thought this was fantastic it was very high expectations um, and it wasn't until the cast read through where the characters didn't really say anything and the person who was reading the description was doing most of the talking and I'm thinking mm, <laughs> gee whiz there's not really any conflict between characters here and okay well but here we are we're going to start shooting. T tomorrow, you know. Oh. So, you know, um, uh, low budget, uh, 12 hours, uh, you know, the plug was pulled. Um, 21 strips on a day. Oh. Uh, and a huge amount of action. And uh, I did my best. And you know what? In the end, it wasn't very good. Um, part of it was, but the other part wasn't. And thankfully, in the very end, it, it people realized that it was actually the writer and not the director. So that, that's kind of rare. Oh, it was both. It was both of us, but at least they acknowledged. It wasn't, it wasn't all the director, yeah. Uh, um, I, I have a couple of horror stories. Thank goodness not too many, but we all have them. I, ha I went on a show that was hugely popular. It was huge. And everyone, the whole show running, writing team was in a power grab. Uh. So everyone was telling me different things. Uh. And it was usually against one of the other producers. I mean, it was like literally walking through a minefield, you know? And it was the same thing, like, do 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 just, <laughs> you know? <laughs> you, you, and, and it was very, it was not fun at all. I was definitely considering other career options, like working <laughs> at Starbucks or <laughs> opening a flower shop, poetry reading bookstore, you know? But, but I mean, you, you know, Again, we have to go through it. And in some way, as horrible as it was, oh, and yes, even worse, there, the two youngest writers were the writers of the episode. Oh. So the new, and, and the only women. Oh. So, and they, these poor women were being pulled apart because they're getting opposite feedback from everyone. Well, it's just not going to work, you know. It was a, a great example of how you would never want to do anything. <laughs> yeah. And, and, but I learned from it. Yeah. You know, uh, and, and I was actually on something this past year as a co-EP um, where it was a marriage of a young showrunner with an older showrunner, and it was not a good marriage. Mm. And that, you know, sometimes it works beautifully, and this was one where it didn't. And what was the gender of both of those people? Both male. Huh? Yeah, because I would just say, in our experience, once again, being sexist, it's... <laughs> As you are. I, yeah. like, with, I, I just, in our experience, women are used to collaborating, or at least if one of the parties is a woman, and when you have a co-showrunner situation, then 
because yeah. you've done that before. We've done. We've been in that position yeah. several times and with, with Yeah, and but I've seen two men do it. Lots of times we've been on shows, and it just it becomes this clash of egos often. And mm. this was t I, I don't know if it was a gender issue. I wouldn't even go there necessarily. It was just creatively, yeah. you know, you put oil and water together, and it's not going to work out very well. Yeah. I don't know where that choice came from, but it, it you know it's never fun being in that position. No. Mm -hmm. You know, and you hope you know you don't have too many of those experiences. Yeah, you know? well, and also uh -huh. when trying to support other directors, you know, in that. Um, yeah, it's tricky. Yeah. So that being said, why do these relationships here work in a really specific way? Do you know what I mean? Like, what can you give tangible examples of collaborate? Like, when you've had a problem and how you've collaborated specifically? I, I think guess. right off the bat, respect, mm -hmm. mutual respect, and awareness of the talent in the room. You know, on everyone's part. And that everybody brings a different skill set to the table. And um, we're all expecting each other to be the very best that we can be. And that, I mean, that's where it begins. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Respect, uh, the trust, and a lot, um, you know, open mindedness and uh, a lot of humor. I think. Yeah. What's an example <laughs> of, how, of how the respect tangibly? Apply. I could give you an yeah. example um, yeah. on The Good Wife with Robert and Michelle, um, which I, I'm sure you remember, but maybe um, it was I, one of my first ones that I did, and there was an issue um, with one of the actors' availability, and so it had to do oh, that's with... that's only happened with, once. I know. No. <laughs> no, 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 it happens all the time. But, but as far as like too many scenes too many pages with this actor and so and it was a problem for production and you know at some point and again like you know these Robert and Michelle they're doing 22 episodes you know what I mean so there's there's always they're always cranking out the, every you know script going on so by the time you're just about ready to shoot and then it's coming down to production issues and then story issues and I remember being a, like really really excited about the fact that it, I came up with a solution that I ran past the person, you know, in charge, a producer in New York, and was like, okay, go ahead, you know, we'll talk to Robert, Michelle, whatever. And it was a way to cut down that character's, like, keep the integrity of what the, the thread of the scenes was. And I don't know if you remember, but and anyway, and sort of combine them and, like, cut, it would end up losing a couple pages, you know, and, and a whole scene or something. And so I remember that was, a, a, that was, like, a welcoming to me. I felt like, wow, because it happened. It wasn't, like, a big ordeal, but it worked, and we all agreed, and it was like, oh, good. Like, they get it, they get it. It was like a huge message for me of like, this is where I want to be. Something simple because I can get very, I mean, you know, skittish when you walk in and you're just, especially when you're walking in and, and, and I've been in all these situations you're talking about, closing the door, talking shit, blah, 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 you know, and you're just like, whoa, and to like have someone actually listen because it was a simple thing, but it was something that nobody was really wrapping their head around solving. Do you know what I mean? I mean, they just didn't come up with a solution yet. So that was... That was just where I fell in love with them, sort of. And one of the things it seems is to now, with more experience and understanding the politics of both sides, but also like what both sides have to contend with. Like Leslie and I are working on our True Blood right now, and um, we were, you know, like it's just a big show. There's tons of visual effects and things. I mean, it's fangs and goo drops and blood and. Um, <laughs> Do you know, and so, but the script right now is kind of a moving target. We got like a like as the season after this, we are like <laughs> <laughs> no, <laughs> and as the season where it's like you know one through six, you have a lot of time to work on it. And it's also, awesome. but like now I'm episode eleven, mm -hmm. which is always where everything has to get you know solved before mm -hmm. the finale, basically. So, so it keeps changing and I really kind of like that about television do you I mean I like that it's this kind of like evolving you really have to stay on your feet but um, so Leslie who's just watching the episode and I'm is it'd be great if we could add some sex into the episode because there wasn't any sex do you know what I mean and in my head I have to be like okay the way this room works is I have to go and everybody's very autonomous but I have to go and sell mm. 
the sex scene because everybody's signed off. Do you know what I mean? And the thing is, is like once everything's signed off, it's really like a, a pain in the ass yeah. to go back and but you have to fight for your episode too. Do you know I mean? and everybody's collaborative, but it's like the technical process is that I have to like go and email everybody and people aren't together and you have to kind of have this discussion over email over like adding a sex scene. Meanwhile, production will have to build a set for that. And But it was this great where I was like scribbling out, but I was agreed with her that it'd be great if we could make it work. And then I was like, as a director, I would like this. It was a character like beat, not was just a, a sex beat. scene. Exactly. <laughs> no, but it, but. <laughs> <laughs> but what was really nice, what was really nice about what Leslie did is she was, do you know what I mean? Like, I'm looking global, she's looking specific, and then she was just like, it'd be great if we could do this, and then I had to figure out. But then I was like, right, and I, and I just walked into her office, and I was like, how do you want, before I write this, do you know what I mean? Like, how do you want the, the sex, literally, like, what position do you yeah. want it to be in? Because in episode seven, they were doing this, and I directed a lot of the L word. So, like, as a director, I know that, like, it does make a difference. Do you know what I mean? Like, how you stage it, and what do you, and like, and I was like, just because we have to do this quickly, how do you want it? You know, and then you <laughs> figured it out. I had just dirty. come from yeah. trying to figure out how to kill seven vampires in yeah. different ways. And I, no, but it, then you, and yeah. I didn't want to have to like go back and rewrite and yeah. her to have to come to me and be like, okay, I can't do it because I have to stage it. So I was just like, I put director hat on. I was like, you tell me how the sex will work and I'll write it and then we'll put it in the episode and then I'll sell it to everybody and then we'll go. Um, so that's what's happened. Yeah. You know what but it was a... I thought a really tangible way of collaborating where she pointed out a story issue that you had to kind of, I had to go fight for. So you have the initial like, oh, God, I don't even want to go do that fight because you're doing like yeah. everything else. But then ultimately you have to because if it makes it better. Um, the other yeah. thing that's really interesting because we've all worked on various shows is that every show has its way of working. So, you know, with a writer being on the set or not on the set, like I spent eight years based at John Wells Productions. There were never writers on the set. Yeah. It would, the, the script is given over to the director as in a film and you do it you know and or I've worked a lot with Aaron Sorkin Aaron Sorkin has no stage directions you could have an eight-page scene with he enters you know with 20 actors you know so you put it where you want you you block it the way you want and Matt Weiner on Mad Men writes he picks up the cigarette he lights it very you know, specific it, yeah. it's yeah. One extreme to the other, mm -hmm. you know, whether, you know, and, and I love having a writer on the set because I feel, again, I've got my collaborator right there with me. And in this case, you're looking out for the series and I'm looking at the episode. But when you're on the set, how great that you've got someone, you've got the other pair of eyes there. So I love that. But it's really different wherever you go. Mm -hmm. You know, and and that's, you know, that's the kind of fun of the game in some way. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, I found that we have um, on the killing a seven day shoot, which is very yeah. hard. Taxing. Yeah. Yeah. And, and you know, our, our scripts are the same size as True Blood script. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's a big show, actually. It's a really yeah. big show. Yeah. And so um, we of, often get into production issues. You know, how can we make our days? It's impossible. Right. And so we found that um, just talking about collaboration in a good way, like when we were working with Dan Adias last time, I'm sure we had the same thing with you, but it was so long ago, I can't remember. <laughs> <laughs> last season. But if a director says, you know, I think we can cut this scene, and as a writer, you're always thinking, no, I love my scene. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But then maybe they do have the overall picture for that that um, that actual show. So then when you really look at it, this has happened numerous times, you think, okay, I really like that scene, but we could lose it. It's not going to harm story. It's not going to hurt character. And so um, they come up with solutions that really are helpful. You know, instead of just cutting lines out of a scene, which doesn't change the number of strips or whatever. Yeah. Well, just to have a, a, a showrunner who really understands about production in that way, oh. because, you know, directors always laugh, you know, fourth of a page, Atlanta burns, you know. Yeah. <laughs> they take town after town. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> last year I had one where it said, and she kills him in an interesting and cheap way. <laughs> <laughs> okay, gotcha. Um, but but again, you know, 
cutting three lines from a scene doesn't help because you still have to shoot the scene. You still have to block it and light it and shoot it. You know, it's how we can together figure out a way to keep the integrity, but actually be able to shoot it, you know, and make the day. Because that's part of it, too. I can tell you also one of the best experiences I had on a show that's not around anymore either um, was I, I did an episode, and then they were in trouble. They didn't have a script for the next one. And so, and they told me this, like, during prep, you know. And so I was like, that's fine. So they asked me to stay. I ended up doing, like, three in a row. And I stayed, and um, we literally... I don't know. I was only there for a few days, and the writer was was John Tinker was running the show, who gave me the, again the message right up front: this is going to be collaborative. He like told me, "Come meet me with me tomorrow morning." This was um, Hawthorne. Like we're going to we're going to Will's trailer, Will and Jada's trailer. We're going to sit in the trailer and we're going to brainstorm with Will mm -hmm. and 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 Caleb, her brother, and we're going to like try to figure out what the hell we're going to do with that <laughs> script. Now I'm like, I've never had an experience like this in TV, so I'm like, okay, great. There's no idea literally spending hours and hours then going back at night because we didn't lock anything down go back at night oh my stuff God. is still going on nine o'clock at night we're like wow and i mean they're ready to make you know independence day three or something <laughs> so i'm like wow and and anyway you know what it was an amazing experience we never quite locked it down we ended <laughs> up i'm not kidding we kind of had a concept for half of the script i got handed scenes the day of oh my God. went and shot them it was a brilliant experience for me it, because it was it had to be collaborative right there was no choice so sounds terrifying and it, but it was exciting for me it was exciting like, and so but what yeah. happened is we did half of the episode turned into a therapy session where jada was playing um the fictional character being interviewed by a real therapist and we only shot one side so once we figured out what the questions and what was what we were actually going to use then we went and put an actor in and shot the other side on stage but we had a day where we had a, that day where we had a call sheet with nothing on it it was just a call sheet wow and so i went to That's the crew like David Milch. We yeah. built a yeah, set. It was, a brilliant David it was Milch, amazing but, yeah. but we built a set and i just got the crew and i was like you know what we have three cameras we don't know what's going to happen today we could be here for <laughs> Eight hours, ten hours, we could be here for three hours. We have no idea, but this is probably the only time we're doing live television, and this is going to be like so much fun. I mean, I was super excited, and I thought it was brave of Jada, like beyond brave, and the episode, again, it, it was just great, and the scenes I kept getting handed once we, you know, I came up with an idea, like, again, it was all John Tinker. We were just like this team, like forging through this insanity, and it was it was so great, and the episode came out really great. Or Will and Jada so it was, it was Separated? Huh. No, 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 no. <laughs> no, 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 no. Yeah. <laughs> I had a lot of um, <laughs> on the L word. It was really fun because sometimes you would the the culture of that show was that you had the scripts, but they would often shift while you were shooting. I mean, there was an improvis improvisational nature to that show, which mm -hmm. sometimes was amazing, like just amazing stuff that was really tangible would come out and sometimes it was a fiasco. Do you know, like, and you were like, what's happening? Yeah. Like it just kind of goes, but I really liked it too because sometimes you just go in right. and you had a scene, but then it, it just becomes something else while you were like shooting it. Like either it just wasn't working how you did or the actors came up with something and it, the, the um, uh, I loved working with Eileen because she would kind of, I mean, that was the culture of the show, and she yeah. really led it, and her idea was that she'd hire independent filmmakers to come and really put their mark, mark yeah. on the thing. And sometimes I felt like watching the show was really erratic, you know what I mean, because it didn't have this kind of, you know, same exact tone per episode, um, but it was really fun to make <laughs> <'cause>, <laughs> um, because you got to, I mean, almost like to such an extent that you there is something just do this, you know, yeah, exciting do what about you that. Yeah. Where, yeah. you know, the rules go up in the air because you have to just completely be in the moment with it. 
with the actors, with the writer, with the material, and n not that you'd want to do that all the time with no script, no. But, yeah. but there is something, it's like exercising a different, mm -hmm. a different yeah. muscle. And, I mean, but I would pray that for all happen. directors out there that that does not happen to you ever, no. because yes. that is totally. a, not a well-run well show, no, I, I and you are you. in hell. Right. I'm giving you the, <laughs> yeah. the uh, like extreme example of collabor being right. forced into collaboration. Well, also, you However, have to be able most, to do that. You yeah. have to be able to do that, yes. but, but you don't want to. No. The most <laughs> Exciting. World, you want your script day one of prep yes. or even before. The so most can... exciting thing yeah. for me as a director is to have a kick ass script. Yes. To exactly. be handed a script that is so good that my wheels start and I'm obsessed with it. Yes. And it's like, and that's what I get. That's what on, you dream. On the good wife. Yeah. That's what I get. Yeah, I, I'd like to ask a question. Can I ask a question? Yes, please. I'd like to ask whether you all, I think you spoke to it a little bit, but do you, do you think that women directors are held to a different standard? when you're first brought onto a show. Because I've seen, honestly, women directors come in, do a pretty good job, never come back on the show, mm -hmm. and then plenty of male directors who don't do necessarily as good a job, but they just keep working. Right. So, yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, you guys have I'll, different levels of I'll, experience. I'll, so. I'll speak for our show. We, I don't think that happens on our show. Um, Looking back on this last season, um, twenty seven out of our twenty two episodes were directed were female directed, which given the percentage in the DGA is yeah, pretty good. Not bad. Yeah, oh, that's good. Um, but we are so underwater in terms of time, we can't, frankly, afford to be politically correct. In other words, we have to hire the best people in every position, whether they're male or female. Right. So, I mean, we love Rosemary, we love Leslie. If they woke up tomorrow morning as men, it would fuck up their lives but not their opportunity to direct The Good Wife. Yeah. I mean, we would have to have them back because they're really talented. And I mean, I think we, we can only afford to look at that because we are so screwed time-wise. Do you think they're given the same opportunities, women directors, as men are? On our show? It well, sounds on like show, on, your, on show, your show, definitely. Your show definitely I, but, yeah. but in general, it in just In general, seems, I can't speak to. Yeah, I can just look at the no, numbers. Well, Paris Barkley, who's sitting over there. Hi, Paris. Paris and I are chairs of the diversity committee at the DGA. And, you know, I can't believe that we're even discussing this still in this day and age. Because right. when I started yeah. directing, I, I never thought this was an issue. I And then I just can't even believe that it's still an issue. But, you know, it, no. You're, it, it's not the same. Uh -uh. It should be the chain, same. I know when I'm in the position to hire, last year I hired half minority and women. So you have to have the willingness. I know that every show I'm on this year, I'm the only woman. Yeah. You know, yeah. and uh, you know, do should you hire someone? And I agree, Michelle, totally. You have to hire the best people, but there are plenty of good women and minorities. And I can also life. say it's yeah. it's it's the networks. It is. It's the I, networks I, I, because you, they are the ones who sign off, and yeah. they're the ones who kill so many. And you of get the a diversity list. hires. You get, you yes. get the approval yeah. of the studio list, and then you have the network list, and you can fight. And you know, you'll win a couple of battles. You're not going to win all your battles. Right. You know. And that's just the reality because yeah. ultimately it's not completely one person's decision or a showrunner's yeah. decision. But, you know, I think everyone has to be aware of trying to make a difference in that way. Yeah, I think a lot of showrunners actually would have a much more diverse, you know, slate of directors. And we have, I mean, we've, we've, we've been in this business for 22 years and we have seen network after network just kill opportunities for, for women and minorities. There are, so think, there are showrunners who don't yeah. think to right. go to women directors. Yeah, you have, to, you have to have a showrunner who pushes, too. You yeah, have to fight for minority people and Right, and Nicole, I think you're right. I think certainly starting out, you need to be better. Yeah. You yes. know, if you just come in and you're average, it's going to be harder. You have to come in and really be an a have to be better. You a have to plus, be an A, a plus student. student. Yeah. yeah. But there yeah. are times when I don't mean this from an ego place, but where you do really well on a show that and you're still, the one, yes, yeah. and they really don't like you to shine that much. Yeah. Because there's a guy, producer, director, or whatever, and and so they're they don't threatening. Want you to show. Yeah. Yeah. I mean. Yeah. I mean. Yeah. That happens. That's. Yeah. <laughs> 
What is it about the list? Like, what is it about the networks? Like, what are they worried about? Fear. You know, I mean, the list. Like, fear and money, but like, yeah. like, can you identify what pushes something over the top or what gets, I mean, like, in that critical moment when somebody's well, it like, makes oh, me yeah. feel, uh, you know, I've seen this numerous times where a woman's given one shot, and um, I'm sure, I'm sure if it's the same given, for yeah. If they're given one shot and it's not perfect, or they haven't made their days every, and even even if other guys mm -hmm. haven't made their days either, then the rap they get is, oh no, they didn't make their days. Right. We're not going to hire them again. And, and, and you just get that one shot as a woman, or maybe a minority director too, and then. Um, that's it. Well, I've heard, well, we hired a woman once and it didn't work. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. So can yeah. you imagine, we hired yeah. a white guy once. <laughs> no more white guys. We're done. You know. Done. Finished with them. You know. yeah. So it, it, it is a different standard. But you're right. I mean, you have to come in. I mean, don't we all know that as women and minorities? Don't we all know that the only way we're going to succeed ever since beginning day one, high school, college, everywhere, you had to be better. You have to be better. You can never be good as good as. You have to be better. And then you have to prove that you're better. And the, the list, the list is created by networks. And networks, what do they listen to? They listen to hype. So you have to find a way that you're hyped, you know, that you have done something really cool and are dark and edgy or, you know, hilarious or you have to, you have to be extremely great at something so that, that there's enough hype around you that they're willing to take that risk on you. Because if you're just somebody who's done a good job somewhere else, that, that doesn't necessarily, you know, sway them. They want to feel like they're getting the very, very best. But I do think the the culture of the show is important because sometimes, I mean, certain shows I've heard of, like, I, I won't mention, <laughs> <I won't> mention. <laughs> but it's so male dominated, mm -hmm. you know, and white male dominated mm -hmm. that it's a woman or a minority coming in, you basically don't have a shot. You're not part of that club. And no matter how good a job you do, you're fucked. But I just have to say, on the other side of that, I was uh, the co-EP on a Sean Ryan show that was an action show, and he is completely blind to well, that. Well, I, yeah. so I don't it's think it's the are, type of show. I think yeah. it's the per I mean, obviously, Sean Ryan's a yeah. great guy. And, he, and it's an action show. Yeah, yeah. but there are no. plenty of men who don't totally. um, really like women or... I don't know how they feel about minorities, or they don't feel comfortable. Right. You know, so it's that's the weird thing is I feel like because people are like I'm black and gay and a woman and a thing. Do you know what I mean? Like, and then people are always like, what? Like, you know? Yeah, do you know what I mean? Like, and I overkill. Was, no, it's true. You know, like, and then I was trying to figure it out because I've been trying to crack this for years because I was like, what is it? Because ultimately, people are very limited. Do you know? Like, I mean, just. In their in their thing, and because I was always like the studio, like, and it sounds obnoxious, but I'm like, if you're like, they're kind of people. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Like, they actually yeah. don't want to. Like, they're super stressed. All of them, the network people, they the showrunners, yeah. the studios, whatever. They're so worried about their job and their thing, whether they're going to be on the air and all this stuff. And then they don't like. Then they have this comfort zone. Right. Yes. Do you know yeah. what I mean? Yeah. So exactly right. I don't think it's not like it's like a racist, like with a no. capital R. I think it's just like comfort that's zone. their world. It's just comfortable. Like they just kind of they don't want to like if they don't have to, kind of, and just go out of their comfort right. zone I in a way exactly, yeah. and so when you go to them I feel like there's part of what you're saying about there's some razzmatazz there's something about the like I'm an artist and I am so super awesome that yeah. like I'm going to bring something that you can't figure out yourself. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Like totally. I am added value yeah. so that because I'm so rad but also I am going to make this super easy for you. Do you know what I mean? Like you can trust me with your gazillions of dollars and your thing like I can I can do it. Like no sweat and you'll have a blast with me. Do you know what I mean like and so it's kind of like mitigating there's just like anxiety coming from all sorts of different realms and I think your job as a director or as a showrunner is just to like just absorb it and make it go away. Yes. Do you mean kinda of like you're just kinda of like, okay, you don't have the script's not right. Oh, great, okay, we'll yeah. figure it out. Do you know what I mean? Not be like, oh my God, why didn't you finish the script on time? And cause then you're like, well, I have a two year old and I this yeah. and you know, and they changed <laughs> it and they got rebroken and then you're like all stressed out and then you don't like the person. So <laughs> yeah, but you're, you're absolutely right. Yeah, I mean yeah. we need to we have to make them feel comfortable and in a certain way. You're just still 
taken care of it. Do right. you know what I mean? So I feel like when people approach these people, that there has to be a um, confidence in your own skills and your ability to perform under any circumstances. You right. perform if there's zero on the call sheet or if you've had the script yeah. for like 21 forever. strips. Yeah. And that you need to go in and like I remember somebody was like, what, you know, like why did they hire you to direct this Disney movie? Like it makes no sense. Which <laughs> is kind of true. But I was like, because and I was like, you have to make somebody, they're going to give you like $75 million. Do you know what I mean? Like, I'm not giving somebody, so, like if you take like all the money you have in your bank account and then you say, here, just like you're going to want to know what type of person that is and what kind of thing and have like a lot of confidence. And so it's a big step is to believe it yourself first and foremost and then convince other people right. that you... Right. can do it and not to lie about it yourself like a lot of people can't do it like you don't have the skill set you can't you can't be like i deserve it if you if you can't do can't it. do it yeah. you know what i mean like so it's like figuring out how to accumulate the knowledge and the wherewithal so that you can feel confident in that situation and then traverse it from there have you guys all on your shows had um like you allow directors to observe before they're either going to direct, or even if they're not going to direct, somebody who's never really seen it. Yeah, we do. We have that, we have directors that shadow on the set. Shadow and stuff. Yeah, yeah sure. that seems like a great way for someone to become more confident. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I've had that in almost everything I've ever directed. Yeah. Try to do that. I think it's really important. Yeah, that's. You know, we have to grab the hand of the next generation. But I want to echo. I think it's important. You have to know what you really know and what you don't know. You know, so that you can learn what you need to know. Because pretending you know something you don't will only get you in trouble. <laughs> because someone will know, and then you're going to get caught. So you know, it's it's having that balance between the two that's so important. Because the round yeah. robin with directing is that you can't know how to do it unless you've done it. That's nobody right. wants to give you a chance to do it unless you. you know, so right. you end up in this thing because you could observe all you want, but, but it's you not till you're like to there, it. like you know, with no set and pages that don't work until yeah. you. <laughs> you know. But I just, I just want to throw out there something though that um, this past pilot season a few months ago, um, I had a meeting with at a production company that's very prolific in TV, and. I was with two women executives who right under, you know, the executive who's a female, and they basically, this woman said to me, well, there aren't that many women directors. Oh. Yeah. So I don't know where that disconnect happens. These are people that work in TV. I mean, they really have a lot of shows, and they do really well. So I don't know how that. Mm -hmm. There seems to well, be more than just I've heard us that a lot. showing I, up doing I can a good tell job. You, yeah, we hear that. We, the diversity committee, we go and meet with studios and networks. We hand them the list. We hand it to them. It's a big, thick, bloody list. Mm -hmm. you know, so and it's they have there. problems with everyone. They have problems with everyone and on that list. These are yeah. directors who have a lot of experience. Yeah. It's not like, you know, it, so it's not like that list is there. You know, I have a list that I, you know, we all, it, it's. You know, I, I actually hate to be the person defending a network, God forbid. <laughs> but I, I will say that uh, we get reminders from the network, be sure you're not leaving out diversity candidates. Well, that's great. They they are aware, that, and I'll, I'll name it, it's CBS. That's great. They are, they are making a point, you know, and luckily we're, you do we it. We don't. We do it, but only because we want the best. Right. I mean, it, it. Our writers room. We have seven writers. Last season, four of them were women. This season, three of them are women. And but frankly, again, if all the best candidates were women, they'd all be women. But all if, on the flip side, if all the best were guys, gotta, we'd hire the guys, yeah. because we again don't have the time for anything else. Mm -hmm. But. Again, CBS it, at least is paying attention. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But we've uh, like early in our career, we had the experience of talking to an executive producer on a big CBS show. This is a long time ago, not that it was CBS. And this producer actually said to us, "Well, if we hired you, I'd be worried there'd be too many female voices in the room." <laughs> yeah, that's how we got hired on that show. <laughs> Yeah, because we talked to somebody else and we said, this is what the showrunner says. <laughs> and it was somebody higher up and went, oh, that's not good. <laughs> <laughs> <I know. laughs> 
do they have the questions? Oh. The I can. I think we're on schedule. All right. Is anybody? I'm going to open it up to uh, our. Let's see. Michelle King. Okay. Uh, this is just like a game show. Um, <laughs> <laughs> how is it working with your husband? How do you handle disagreements? Oh, um, I, honestly, I don't understand how people do it and not work with their partner. I, I mean. Because the job is so big, I, first of all, I don't understand how anyone manages to do it solo. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it would be a horrible drag to be the one so immersed in a show and then you go home, first of all, not nearly as many hours as you'd like, and then this person is completely disconnected with it. Mm -hmm. So for us, it's very natural. We've mm -hmm. been doing it a long time it's we pretty much understand what each other's strengths are the disagreements luckily i think if we were doing something with a finite product the fights would be worse i mean like if you're making kimonos mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and you've cut the silk wrong you are screwed <laughs> but if it's about words then okay worst case scenario you erase the wrong ones and you write the right ones so I feel like that just lends itself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, can you talk about the best way to work with network executives as a showrunner? Good question. Anyone? Well, uh, to the room. <laughs> <laughs> You know, just make them feel really, really confident. Yeah. You know that you know what you're doing, that you you listen to them, that even if what they're saying makes no sense, you don't say. <laughs> that makes no <laughs> sense. <laughs> Which is what you want to say. You 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 just listen because everybody everybody in this business, you know, we're all just trying to do a good show, right? And everybody, we all have different languages. Writers, directors, actors have different languages. So we all have to just listen and try to like parse out <laughs> the meaning for ourselves. And that's what that's what you do with a, a network is just make them feel like they are being heard, mm -hmm. and you are responding to the best of your ability. And um, and then you just hope for the best. <laughs> uh, we have another executive producer in New York, Brooke Kennedy, and she made the smartest remark that I've heard on this, which is you don't go to the studio or the network with a problem without already having the solutions. Right, absolutely. And I, and I think that's a very smart insight, mm -hmm. which is figure out the solve and so that when you're telling them what the problem is, you already have a plan. They are very busy. <laughs> they really so don't want to have to stop and solve your problem, but they will, right. and it won't necessarily go right. Mm -hmm. So if, if you already have a path, then you can talk it over with them. I mean, mm -hmm. to my mind, that, that's the best manner. That's very smart. I think that goes with directing too, like talking about getting a script and then having no, and, and also having the solution, not just being a, a problem person. You know? that, I think that's very true. Right. Like because there's, it's like if there's open-ended anxiety, that can just metastasize into like all sorts of things and be like, and they're bangs, you know, like that's terrible. Get them new hair too. Like while you're at, like it's just this free floating anxiety. So yeah. part of the like confidence they, thing yeah. is to kind of like just narrow it down. Do you know what I mean? So if you have a fix, then they can move on to the next. Right, because they do <laughs> have a lot of things going yeah. on, and they they would prefer it if you're not a problem. Yeah, they just don't want it to be a problem. Well, so I, would I, don't, give, I, don't want to be I would give the opposite advice to the network, though. I would say to them, if you have a problem, just tell what the problem is. Right. Don't <laughs> solve it. Right, exactly. <laughs> no, I think you're right. That's really the problem we get with the network is they try to solve it. <laughs> <laughs> it's very bad. All right, what are your feelings about having a new director observe or shadow on a set? I'm great about that. I love to help. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I would say that it's always been great, with the exception of one incident, in which, and I won't name this person, but she did not. She had, she was a featured director of some acclaim, and she did not understand the role of somebody 
um, who is shadowing a director, mm -hmm. which is basically, you know, at least from my understanding, you know, you could you watch them, you ask questions, but you stay out of the way. Like this person was actually sharing the monitor with the director all the time, so it's like, I'm sorry, there's no room for you guys to look because yeah, we're looking at them. So writer producers pushed out of the way. <laughs> Not good. <laughs> she just didn't understand that it, we weren't really interested in hearing her, her feelings about the scene or her solution for whatever the problem was. Um, Did anybody tell her? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, and she answered that. Was it didn't sink in. <laughs> didn't sink in. No, she you know, really just like, I understand you have a problem with me. It's like, no, we just need to collaborate with the director, and if you're getting in the way, that's not helping. That's not good. But, yeah. anyway, I, but I, I think, you know, 99% of the time, I've never seen that happen, you know. Yeah. I did once, I learned this early on, I was actually in a theater, like I was shadowing a theater director, and I sat through the whole, it was like a six-week rehearsal process, and like I didn't talk to him, yeah. I didn't, you know, I mean, I like sat and I took notes, but we had this very like formal relationship and I just sat silently through the whole thing. And then on the night before opening uh, previews, he said, hey, I'm gonna take you out to dinner and you can ask me anything. You know, and, I was, and I was like, oh my God, this is so great. Do you know what I mean? And he took me out to the like fancy theater restaurant and he was like, all right, hit me. And, and then I said, I was just wondering um, why like blankety blank about the story and his face just turned white uh, do you know what I mean like Ash and like and I was like and I just didn't you know I was just wondering but I inadvertently in my youth just pulled this thread that had actually been like the bane of his existence which he'd been fighting about for weeks which is never like with the playwright like these huge fights but I didn't know do you know I just like dug in like right in the thing <laughs> before previews, before when he could no longer fix it, when he was terrified right before he was gonna get reviewed. Like I was the harbinger of this show's not gonna go well in my little like naked. twenty two year old it. self. Naked. Yeah. You know, yeah. and I was just, like and he turned white and then he literally like sh I caused so much anxiety with this poor man. Um and then he like abruptly ended the dinner and oh, left no. because, and I just felt terrible. But I was like, even if you're shadowing and everybody seems like on high, that they're actually going through a lot of stuff. So you actually have to be careful, weirdly, of their emotional state. Like everybody's really stressed out. So it's not a dig against you. But if you're just like, I'm just wondering, because this seems like it's crap to me. Yeah. Like, you know, like then, like you're gonna like get a big reaction. So weirdly, <laughs> you know, like too bad he didn't take you out to dinner six weeks earlier. <laughs> no, you know, I just didn't think that I had any ability to even, you know, like I was a fly, like, who could impinge their thing, but I realized that I'd really, like, <laughs> had an impact, and, like, anybody can when you're invited into this formative, creative experience, and the thing about television is it's fomenting ongoing, like, it doesn't ever resolve, even while you're shooting it, so just to be cognizant that you know, weirdly, your opinion does matter, and so that's why you, you don't want it. Yeah, people yeah. care what. Yeah, yeah. you do. I, I, have, I have yeah. had I have had some people shadow me, but often I'm not able to have, have someone shadow me because a, it could be the first time I'm on a show, um, or it could be a set like Rescue Me where you don't have people. I mean, you just you know, because sometimes there's just or it's a huge action show or something where my focus has to be here, and in that case, it'll be like, well, why don't you come by for a couple hours, you know, kind of thing, rather than have someone they are like constantly so it, it's really up to the showrunner too to like allow that person to come or not it's I think sometimes people think it's all up to the director to bring someone on but it's really not up to me right. so I do it all the time whenever it's possible because I think you know yeah why not I I did it I shadow with a couple of people before I directed my first show it's an incredibly informative situation but it is not a job Mm -hmm. You know, it is, and, and it's great to be able to observe and see how all choices are made and creative choices, you know, so yes, I think it's a great thing. But there are definitely shows that don't allow it, don't want it, yeah. and, and that's, you know, that's just how it is. Yeah. Can you talk about the pilot process, specifically directing the pilot episode and setting the tone for the series? To the floor. Oh, I've done a bunch of pilots. Have you? 
No. You, my favorite oh, pretty little yeah, liars. Yeah, you talk. Oh, oh, <laughs> um, I've had really good experience. I've had a couple of not so great experiences on pilots, but mostly really good experiences. The, the last one I did, I did the pilot of the Gilmore Girls, and uh, Amy Sherman Palladino, who is uh, remains a friend, is an amazing character. I don't know if any of you have worked on that show, uh, and um, yeah, you that is that is the job. You know, that is the job, to find the visual language for that show and to have the collaboration with the writing showrunner, you know, to to really figure out what that's going to be. But that is, you know, that's the job of the director on the show is to find the tone, you know, and and establish the look of the show and casting and, you know, it's doing a, it's doing a film. It's doing a film, but really quickly. <laughs> you know, and um, the 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 last pilot. Well, I did a pilot last year that didn't get picked up. A dance pilot. I went back to my roots. It was an amazing experience. But the Pretty Little Liars. We did. I had done a movie with the writer Marlene King. She's a very good friend. We had a very specific tone for that show, and we were completely in sync about it. And the network was terrified because it was a network ABC Family that had done kind of shows that look like they're all shot in Gelson's and. <laughs> <laughs> um, this was a very different kind of show for them and for them very risky. And it's wicked. It's like a guilty pleasure, you know. And we knew what we were doing when we went into it, but would they let us actually make the show, you know, that we thought we could make out of it. And we had an amazing experience working on that show. We had, uh, usually I've shot pilots that are like 13 days or whatever. This was nine days. It was less than a tr half of a True Blood episode, you know. <laughs> so it was for very little money. Uh, and again, you know, there's something exciting about that where, you know, you've got three sticks to rub together and you have to figure out what you're going to make of it. But, but the main thing is figuring out what is the tone of the show? What is this story about? You know, who are these characters that are going to continue? And, you know, casting. Casting is a huge part of it. You know, and, and it's wonderful when you're that in sync with the person you're working with. And we were just like, you know, if someone didn't have the answer, the other person did. It was like we were playing this incredible, you know, dance together. And, and usually we were always in sync, and one person would get it if, you know, if I didn't have the answer, she had it. It was great. So, and then I did a pilot last year that, again, this dance pilot, I had an amazing time, but it didn't get picked up. It's heartbreaking. It's heartbreaking because there's no never a life for it again. Mm. You know, so. My friend has a dead pilot party. Oh each my! Because <laughs> <laughs> it's the only come. time you get to see them. Yeah. Yeah. Ever, yeah, it's really well. It is. I mean, it's totally essential that um, that you you set the tone, you set a look, you set you you create a world. Right. Like Patty Jenkins came in and created the world of the killing, and that is a world. When you watch that show, you go there. Yes. And there's and that place doesn't really exist anywhere, but it is it is it's it's a tone and a place and right. and even in the performances from the pilot, I mean everything kind of really began became sort of the template for what the show is, and. Um, it is absolutely essential. Right. But just because you do that doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to be a great episodic director because to do that takes more time. Right. It, it takes does a take lot more time. more time. And also, you hope that the show grows. Yeah. You know, you set the template and the tone and the look, but, you know, five years later, it needs to develop right. as well. It evolves. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. that's exciting. And all the directors and writers come in to help that process. But that is the, you know, that's the beginning. I mean, the pilot of The Good Wife, mm -hmm. amazing pilot. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Charles McDougall. Google did, did a, a fantastic job, but I mean, you mentioned it's like doing a movie, but in less time. Right. Not only that, it's in less time when everybody else in town is trying oh, to get the, for the same, same actors that oh. you are. Yeah. And in, in the case of The Good Wife, we filmed the pilot in Vancouver, knowing that if we went to series, it was going to be filming in New York. Right. So you have none of the same locations mm -hmm. as well. Right. So. It's uh, frankly, it's a miracle when anything works. No, I know. But we did pretty little. <laughs> yeah. Pretty Little Liars was shot in the winter in Vancouver. It was supposed to be summer in Philadelphia. <laughs> and you know, there was a scene where these stick thin girls are wearing bikinis. <laughs> and of course, you know, the network says calls up and said, you know, we love the dailies, but we can see uh, smoke coming out of their mouth. I texted back, it's 17 degrees here. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, really. You're freezing. Really? You sent us here. This yeah. was non-negotiable. <laughs> <laughs> and you're one 
everyone, there's breath coming out of their mouth. <laughs> it's crazy. And also the other thing, which, uh, you know, hair and makeup and wardrobe. If they don't know how to give comments about story, everyone can talk about hair, makeup, and wardrobe. Yeah. That will be the notes. I don't know if you guys yes. experience. Yes, um, absolutely. Always. You know, the red sweater, you know, and it's usually from the person who's the most unstylish. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Or somebody's hair. They get, they get obsessed with hair. people's hair. Yeah. I had, oh, the hair on the lead actor's arm. <laughs> Too much hair. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> EGI. Yeah. But the thing that I love about doing a pilot or about doing a, an episode is that, you know, here you have to really know what the dollar scene is and what the 25 cent scene is. You have to know. You have to know that in a movie, but in a pilot or really in an episode, if you don't know what your story is about, yeah. you know, and you spend the same amount of time as something that's connecting tissue rather than where the emotional content of your story is, that's the, that's the important thing. Absolutely. Yeah. And that's where one gets lucky hiring an experienced director and where the trust comes in because that's a neophyte mistake. That is not an experienced mm. director mistake. And so you are so fortunate if somebody walks in knowing, okay, I'm looking for the dollar scenes. Because mm -hmm. otherwise you're in big trouble. Right. Question. Um, how do you best deal with difficult actors? <laughs> blink, blink, blink. <laughs> I can tell you what I do. Yeah. I just, I just love them. Yeah. Oh, yeah, that's a good answer. Yeah. 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 And I don't, yeah, feed that's into, really true. I don't feed into or react to anything because it's not yeah. about me. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's, that's actually true. We, 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 we've had difficult actor issues and uh, this, you know, last season or so. And, um, and I think that Nicole and I actually had a very good experience. Right. But we've also had a very bad experience with somebody you couldn't love. Yeah. <laughs> Crazy people are hard to love sometimes, but, uh, yeah. but we love even the crazy ones we try. Yeah. I think you need to, you, they need to be listened to, basically. They just need to be able to speak and see that you're, you're really listening to them, and that's where the love comes in. Uh -huh. Yeah. Uh -huh. But you still won't solve it. Right. You still won't solve it, and, and right. they, will, they will ruin your day. And you, but you know what? That actor probably is going to be the actor whose performance is the most interesting performance in your episode. So I, you just right. go, okay, but this I is also, the hand I've been dealt. I also think with the love and being the therapist and the mother or whatever, there's a bit of, you know, stern parent too. Yes. Because people yeah. do need limits. And if someone's behaving badly, that's just not acceptable. If you're, if you're rude to another actor or a crew person, I don't find that acceptable. And usually I found no one has called them on it, you know, and when you do, they're like, oh, okay, sorry, you know, so I think it's, you know, and then some people are just crazy, you know. We have but, seen but an actor sent home, actually, which is one of the, the ballsiest moves wow. a showrunner has ever made. Wow. Um, sent, and, which I think really needed to be done, sent an actor home and gave the dialogue, because it worked for this particular scene, to a, another actor, and then had that other actor always available. Right. Mm. And with the awareness that, you know, that could wow. happen again. And that was like, that was, that was a, that was a tough mom move if there ever was one. Really, but really. it was um, relatively effective. Yeah. 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 <laughs> it, it, it's also amazing with, I think, the tone of a, a new show in terms of that responsibility of number one on the call sheet gets started really early on. Mm -hmm. And if you have one and two on the call sheet, set the tone. I'm thinking of many of you, Babs, who worked on ER with Anthony Edwards and George Clooney, you know, in the beginning, they set the tone. Yeah. You come in, you know your words, you have a good time, you go home, and that's how it runs. And cause someone coming in not being prepared was not acceptable. So I think also as a producing director, I sit down with the number one and two and say, you're my leaders on the set. set the I need yeah. you to help. Sometimes it's worked. I've had situations where it's worked great, and I've had some people that you can't get to do that, but you hope that you can have them help set the tone of what positive behavior is on the set. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I think sometimes honesty helps also when someone is insecure acting out and stuff. Sometimes if you just tell them the bottom line, like what really needs to happen there, it'll just diffuse too, you know? Mm -hmm. 
So recently, after listening for a little bit and coming up with really no solution as to why, or no reason as to why, a particular actress was just crying when she was supposed to be happy in the scene. I finally said, you know what, I, 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 I'm either going to have to shoot around you or you need to snap out of it to protect your character because <laughs> yeah. you're, <laughs> you're making yourself very, your character very unlikable. Yeah. And she did. Yeah. <laughs> but, but, but that was that actress. You know, you have to read the person. Mm -hmm. You can't yeah. do that to anybody. Yeah. Yeah. I once had a sequence where the actress was going through a lot of stuff and she was supposed to be super duper happy in the episode and she had all this um, and I'd been shooting for like two hours and I could just tell, like I knew her well enough at this point and she was just so sad and insecure and felt terrible um, and I went up to her and I was like do you want to wear something else in this scene? <laughs> you wow. know, and she was like, yes. And then I said, um, okay. And then I just went and she did, this was actually on a movie. I don't know if you could do this in television. But, um, and she, I left, you know, and I said, go pick out, because I just knew, like, she felt wow. bad, like, she just felt uncomfortable, you know, like, she wasn't going to be able, she literally was not going to be able to do the scene and what she was wearing, because she was giving herself a head trip about it, and I thought, it's better, we shot for two and a half hours, but I thought, before I turn mm. around, it's actually better to go back, reshoot her, because mm. I won't make it through the end of the day, like, and then, or else we're just going to have to reshoot the whole day, and so... It was odd, but it was like a good call, That's ultimately. So smart. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Yeah, you know, you bring up actually an excellent point. I, I feel like one of our best friends is our wardrobe department mm -hmm. and our, mm -hmm. our wardrobe mm -hmm. designer. They are the first the first people that our guest actors oh, meet, yeah. mm -hmm. and we happen to have somebody who's both extremely talented and extremely nice. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And to have the actors meet someone who listens to them and is really talented to make them look terrific mm -hmm. is such a blessing. Mm -hmm. and who is that? What, what's her name? Uh, his name, Dan his Lawson. Name. Dan Lawson, okay. Good yeah. to know. Yeah. 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 <laughs> but he's busy. I know. <laughs> <laughs> so true. But but really, I mean, in talking about collaboration, that mm -hmm. you you wouldn't ordinarily think, okay, to help the actors, what do I? That you need that, and we we've been tr there have been guest stars that we've been, you know, after and hoping to lure, and we've been on the phone with them, and the final thing they'll ask is, will you let me look really pretty? Mm -hmm. And the answer is, you betcha. Mm -hmm. We've got, we've got the you know the best wardrobe designer in town and sure enough they look really pretty and they'll come back mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it's it's a big plus I can I can tell you um, a story about my first day on rescue me also which um, I, I I had heard through prep um, that the the teaser was like five pages like a five page scene and I heard like from all different people, oh, Dennis wants this to be a one -er, a one -er, a one -er. And I was like, this is not a one -er. like whatever. So we find a location that's brilliant because it's, it's two guys walking through a burning building. I guess he wanted like a super long hallway, but there's no hallway in New York City that's gonna support that and it would have been boring anyway. So, so it's like go through the lobby, get their orders, find a court, we found a courtyard that they could go continue through the building, then another part of the, go into another building and then go down the stairs and then they get trapped in the basement. So we found this perfect location to it into three pieces. Brilliant. So I tape it. I tape myself. You know, I don't often do that, but because I kept hearing this, one or one or from the writer, this and whatever. So I tape it, send it, please get this to him and Martha's been here where the heck he was and you know, whatever. Because <laughs> he was like on like uh, anyway. So um <laughs> so I'm like, okay, it's my first day. No, granted he the reason I was there was because <clears throat> he had he, he had fired the director previous I was booked for two episodes but I was I was literally in New Hampshire I was there to spread my dad's ashes <laughs> I was at Target the day before at Target and I get a call from Apostle and they're like how fast can you get here by Monday? Because he just fired somebody. We need you to come in. I'm like, fine. Send me all the scripts. I'll read them on the train. I'll get there and I'll be there Monday. So that was for prep. So he was already in like an agitated state from working with a director that really did not gel at all. So 
Anyway, so I show up, so he comes on set. I'm super excited. It's my first day on Rescue Me. It took me four years to get on that show. So I'm like, it's my favorite show. It wasn't exist as a good wife then. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, so, so I'm super excited. He comes on set. The first thing he does is start screaming at me. He's a tall guy. He literally starts screaming at me because it's not a one -er. Now I'm like, you know, I'm, but here's the grace of like when you love your job, is like I'm just there and I'm, it was almost like I had smoked a joint, like I don't smoke pot <laughs> anymore, but like I had this outer body experience where he's yelling at me and he smelled really good and he's like looking at me and I was just like, I was like, holy fucking shit, Dennis Leary screaming at me, like I'm on set with him, I can't fucking believe this, like I just like, that's, and he's like, wah, 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 wah. <laughs> at all, like at all. And I just walked him through, like let him finish, walked him through, told him exactly what was gonna happen. He came and then he wasn't satisfied. Then he decided the DP, he was gonna start screaming at the DP, who had nothing to do with prep or choosing the location. So once that happened, then I started to wanna get involved, to defend, you know, like. But then the script supervisor who I had worked with before, she was staying there, she's just like, <laughs> Nothing. And I was like, okay, right, this is their battle. This is the dance they do. Nothing to do with me. Anyway, long story short, by the end of the, you know, he walked out, he was pissed, but I, because I didn't feed into it, it set the whole tone for the whole episode. Mm -hmm. You know, I just told him about my dad, I followed him out to his chair, I like told him about my dad, that I felt like it was a gift for my dad to be on that show, and you know, and it was really, really sweet, and by the end of that day, he gave me a hug. Now, he doesn't hug anybody, and he doesn't hug girls, so I was like, like, unless he's having sex with them on the show or something. <laughs> so, so I'm just saying that was like the grace of like not feeding into someone's Amazing. insecurity, insanity, or whatever. And he's a brilliant actor. And even the most insane people or assholes, or whatever, they really are talented. And that is the one <laughs> job on set that I cannot do. Right. And yeah. I honor that mm -hmm. to the death. Mm -hmm. Like, and that's a great story, yeah. Rosemary. And also, there's something you know, actors are doing something amazing. They're they're going to a place to show us something about the human condition, and that's a very delicate place. And we as directors, you know, have to protect that. And sometimes there's a little crazy that goes with that, but hopefully not too much crazy. But I I have I just all of a sudden had when you were talking had a flashback. I was working on a pilot with a really crazy person. And I went to my shrink because I was ready to kill this person. Like <laughs> violence was going to ensue. And my shrink said to me, you were Margaret Mead doing a research study on a rare species of baboon. And I want you... I, I want you to think of that person as a baboon so that everything they do will be interesting to you. So when you were talking about that, I would sit there and go, whoa, look, look at that weird behavior. Do people really behave like that? You just yelled at that poor person. Wow. You know, and I was able to deal with this person. It changed everything. And it was me adjusting because they weren't going to change. They were going to be you know, batshit crazy no matter what I did, you know. Yeah. <laughs> and I also think uh, from the writer's point of view, <laughs> it's hilarious, is that it's so funny. And it actually works because you're right, it's usually like 95% not about you. No, Do you know totally. what I mean? And just like, I mean, yeah, and well, actually with most, with most everybody, writers, yeah. directors, actors, yeah. anybody. But I think it's an on, it's why I love television, but I think it must be an odd experience. Because if you're an actor and you sign up for a movie, like, you know the end. Yeah. You sign up for the whole script, you know what you're going to do or something. Right. But I always feel like series, yeah. it's weirdly like Greek gods. Do you know what I mean? Like, we're in this room deciding their fate, you know? And then, and then they, and that must be really totally. scary to literally not know week to week a what's going to happen. A huge issue in like, the killing. A huge issue really, for us. Yeah. 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 Huge. And you just have to, and I was just like, for them to have to put faith for, and sometimes you're, you're the Greek god, and you're like looking at the whole thing, and then actors will like lobby for their characters or this, but it must be incredible, like produce so much anxiety to invest your entire life and livelihood and career into a character and then trust this disembodied group of, yeah. you know, five to 20 people in a room who are like, you know, and then they blah, 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 blah. Yeah. And I think that 
Yeah, yeah, we're yeah we're basically saying to the to the actors, you know, just you know, strip naked, right? And yeah. Trust us, have faith in us, and some some actors can go there, and some actors can't go there, and it, and I understand. I would have a hard time. I would never be able to go there. Yeah, that's why I'm not an actor. But well, I was going to also say one of the the things that I feel like a, really a, what a great director can do is. As as writers, we really often don't know how to say it to the actor what what's not there, what needs to be there. And television is so fast; it has to be there. When and there are times, there have been times during the season though where with a really great director, you will you'll just watch a performance and the actor is just shit. You know, not not as a person, but the the, the material is not there, and you're so frustrated because you want it to be so much better, and you don't know how to communicate it in a way that is caring to the the actor because all you're feeling is no no this isn't it and and a great director you pull that director aside and you go no and make them good that's what I mean. you can't even like give them information you, you it's it gets that bad that all you're saying is it's bad and a great director just goes okay i know and then they go and they do everything they can they they work some kind of little magic dance around that person and and find what it is that they can bring to it mm -hmm. and 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 it's not the actor's fault i can't even imagine what it'd be like to just show up and have to do it some way that everybody else wants them to do it and they have no idea what it is with their clothes off with yeah, sometimes <laughs> sometimes with their clothes yeah. off yes and not only that I, I feel like if if we do our job very very badly and then I go to Starbucks, no one's coming up to me to tell me what a bad right. job oh, I just yeah. did. Right, it's so exposed. Uh, you know, but an actor does not have that luxury. Mm -hmm. If either they do their job poorly or you know, or badness is thrust upon them. <laughs> they are, you know, they're stuck yeah. with their face and their recognizability. Right. Yeah. I mean, that's totally vulnerable. Ghastly. Totally vulnerable, yeah. Um, this is uh, how can new directors establish relationships with showrunners and executive producers slash writers? The age old question. I have a lot to say on this actually because the I my <laughs> my friend Jill Soloway, who you may know, who's hilarious and amazing, everything. Um, she said once, if somebody comes and asks me to read a script for them, I say absolutely, and can they come over on Saturday and do two hours of gardening for me? <laughs> <laughs> like, and so, and I was like, and she does. Do you know what I mean? She's just like, okay, and then, or you can go grocery shopping for me, or you, do you, I mean, like, cause she's like, that's like what I get paid, do you know what I mean? My like advice, and that to, there's a difference between, mentoring or doing something or like you have a life and a family and to people too. So my thing is that um, a lot of people kind of, and especially, I mean, be minority on like a bunch of different things, there's the you owe me factor versus the I want to learn factor. Do you know what I mean? Like, and there's a kind of entitlement that I think a lot of people, and I was, you know, really ambitious and hungry when I was a thing, but it's really important to invest in the relationships that you want and that you actually have to give before you get. Like, a lot of people just want to be like, help me. Like, just hire me, read my stuff, give me notes, help me, you know, like, and I'm like, I don't know you, you know, like, so, and you're busy and you're stressed, but what I tried to do is a friend of mine who I went to film school with was making her feature, and I, like, shadowed them for, like, three years, do you know, like, I tried to be, like, a voice, and I watched the cuts, and I didn't, like, it's that, yeah, I learned from my first thing about wrecking that theater director's <laughs> day, and, um, but to kind of like really actually know who it is, know where they're from, know what they care about, and actually figure out how you can honestly help them and invest in a relationship like, and I've had many assistants and I've mentored many people, but I found the ones that have been successful are people who are like, they've worked on, you know, Erin here has worked on a movie for, do you know what I mean? Like she invested like many months of her time and then you can kind of give it, and I feel like that is the most productive when you've actually invested, because you can be like, okay, yeah, sure, watch me for like two weeks. But if you really want to form those relationships, you have to find a way to invest in the people and really help them. And then they in turn will take a specific interest in you and 
as opposed to a general interest in you. And that's when I think like jobs happen and things like that. Right. Yeah. So wonderfully said. <laughs> it's so wonderfully said because I know the, the you know it is a it is a dance you do mm -hmm. you know and you as much as you want to help you can't help everyone and you are going to help the person that you know you yeah. know right. that right. that right. has done a great job for you you know and it just that's how it works i get requests for recommendations from people that i've met one time oh. you know and what can you possibly say? Well, they seem like a nice person. You know, you want to be able to write something enthusiastically based on truth. And, <coughs> you know, it, it is a two-way street in that way. But that's beautifully said, Angela. Yeah. Yeah, I, I would I would also really second that, third that. Because <laughs> the, 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 um, the experiences that I think have been the most successful for, like, writers that, that I, I've known um, have been when I have said to them, they are quietly doing their job being a PA or an assistant or something else, you know, and I, I'm aware that they write and they're, they seem like they're working hard, but they, they do amazing jobs elsewhere. They're the best at whatever it is the job is that they're doing in my vicinity. So that at a point, I might say, if you ever want me to read something, I'll read it. And then that person has to know they get one shot, so they better be ready in every way. But I will, I'll read it. And sometimes it takes me like six months to read something. And I need to be reminded. But um, if it's, if I read it and I'm impressed, then I will go to bat for somebody. I really will. Because I know that I have reached out. Right. I have, I've made that connection. And I, I think it's because I respect their uh, their autonomy, you know, that they have, that they're doing their own thing. They're trying to get it done. And so then I'm reaching out to them. And that kind of works better. And also, me. everyone sitting here has had someone give us a chance. Right. Yeah. We all had that one person on blind trust or whatever say, here, let me help you. Yeah. So we got to pay it forward in that way, too. Yeah. Well, I had to threaten to get where I was. <laughs> you had to threaten? Threaten, yeah. They oh, well, that's great. Me. That's actually great, because you were a great AD. I was an AD, and the yeah. only way I was able to yes. to force my way up, um, after asking season after season, or reminding, saying, remember what I want to do, I don't want to be an AD for my whole life. This has always been my goal since at the age of 15 or whatever. Um, and that was that I, it came to a point on the shield where, believe it or not, I was almost, I have to say almost, indispensable. Not that I was so great, but it was a good fit. And it was such a crazy show, and I knew it so well. And the alternating ADs were rotating. They were, they, we went through like 10 of them. It was incredible, or maybe eight, but that's a lot. Um, so I um, took my wonderful best friend and mentor and, and boss to lunch and said, if you, if you don't bump me up next year, I'm going to quit, and um, and the and this place is going to fall apart. And he <laughs> said, and I said, you know that. And he said, that's a ball faced threat. And I said, it is. <laughs> so, so, um, so then it wasn't immediate though. It, uh, I had to spend the, the next season actually training. I had to give editors uh, my notes on the uh, director's cuts. I had to go to the editing room, wow. sit there. I had to give casting notes. Mm -hmm. um, it was extensive. And then, then finally I passed. Now, I believe, and I could be wrong about this, but I'm pretty sure that the people who came after me, who were men, uh, didn't have to do that. <laughs> but, but you know what? I thank him because it actually taught me a lot. And what I think he was really doing is he was making sure that I would succeed. So yeah. it, was a, it was the greatest gift. Mm -hmm. But it was after. And because basically, you know, they didn't want to lose me as an AD. And then, of course, I couldn't quit. So I had to do both. Right. <laughs> Which is fine. Yeah. 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 I had a friend who was the DP who just did that. And it worked to get her threatened to quit directing. Yeah. 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 She was like, I, I think that I leave the show or, or script you make or AD. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of times I feel like they. Yeah. They'll be like, of course, yes, definitely, we'd love that. But like when it comes to it, you know, then time after time, and so <laughs> and they really, she's a brilliant DP, and they needed her, and mm -hmm. then you know now she has a directing career. Right. <laughs> um, for the directors, how do you break into TV from features? 
so awesome now. How do you break into TV? <laughs> right? Right. Yeah. Well, <laughs> yeah, this is um, like, we're in a golden age of TV. Are. I mean, some totally. of the best writing and directing is happening on TV. I, it's really I, I, I think, I mean, for me, it was, it was John Wells. Yeah. The Shadow Women and Minority, which I don't even know. I don't think he has that anymore because at the time he had ER Third Watch and West Wing. And you have to have made a feature. Right. And so my feature was clearly in the third watch world, like visually and, you know, aesthetically and all that. So that's how I got it. Mm -hmm. I did, um, I made a short of Debs, and then I actually, Eileen Chaikin, the showrunner of The L Word, saw it at this event, and... She it was so random. She was looking for like a funny lesbian. I mean, like literally, like there was like it, there was like one more spot in the writers' room. I had no, I never even like actually thought of wanted to be a writer. Thought of myself as a writer. I'd been like a theater director, and I wanted to do directing. And they just like and it was like a huge. There was like 15 people in the first season, and by season five, there was five lesbians. Wow. But like in the in the beginning, it was. The thinking on that show was, we'll teach writers how to be gay. And then on the end, it was like, we'll teach lesbians how to write. <laughs> like, <laughs> I, like, like, I mean, it's as far as it just weirdly seemed simpler. But like, I was on the, <laughs> it was just, just kind of random. I don't know why, like, but people could, people could understand like murder and yeah. like all of these things, but they're like, why do you dress like a boy? Or like, I didn't, I don't know, they just didn't like get it. So and we were like, okay. Um, <laughs> and I knew Rose Trichet, who directed the pilot mm -hmm. from back in New York, from hanging out or whatever. Um, so, like, a lot of things converge. Do you know what I mean? A lot of times it's relationships you make as you're going. And so that's why it's important to kind of be a cool person the whole way, because it's usually, like... You know, now Vina said is the you know creator of the killing and yeah. things and like like people who you know, mm -hmm. back whenever and you know and we were kind of friends, but it just came at me because usually there needs to be like three voices that get you over the top. Do you know what I mean? Because somebody could be like, oh, I saw this talented short, but they're not going to hire you, and then and then they're like, and then you need the luck. They need one more person they're looking for, and then I happen to know Rose Trichet and Gwen Turner who are on the first season, and they're like, oh, she'd be good. Do you know what I mean? And so that's like four things tipping you over. If it was just one, then you probably wouldn't get the job. And um, so then I just got in that room, and then and then I left, actually. I mean, for the writer's room I was there for the first season, I left to direct features. And then when I came back, I, had a, I already had a relationship with the show. And then I came back as a director and then kind of came on as a writer again. So it was this kind of round-robin way when I actually felt like returning to television because I thought it was super fun. But that's how I broke in. Mm -hmm. I think shadowing is a great way to go mm -hmm. if you can get the opportunity. You know, the person I was mentioning before who was not a good shadow, the door was wide open to her to direct an episode and she yeah. just blew it. Yeah. You know, because she just made enough enemies, she was just obnoxious enough that it's like, never want her directing anything mm -hmm. we're on. But, you know, if she had been the opposite, if she had done it the right way, and and I think then we would have become advocates for her. Absolutely. We would have just said, you know yeah. what, we think she can do it. She has a feature. It's a great feature. Mm. She's observed this whole thing. Let's give her a shot. You know? I think there's a weird thing, actually. I think as a woman director in features, do you know what I mean? That you have to be you know, such a ball buster in a way. Do you know what I mean? Like what works for women directors? Because I feel like... Features are like a one-off. You're like a general, and people like slash and burn, and do you know what I mean? But like, it's it's actually like a more, I think, combative process. Right. I think student, I think, in features, they'll take more chances on people because, like, if a series goes well, you want to be with that person for years. Do you know what I mean? So you have to really like like them and want to hang out with them. You know, like, it's less in movies. They more like. You, you go do that, and you have to like, <laughs> yeah. you know, just kill deal, them. and it's just yeah. like kill them. It's like 18 days or 45 days or whatever. But you like move through it. Like first you're in prep, but you've got to be. I've found as a woman director, like really aggressive in a way to kind of make yourself heard. Like you still have to be 
cool, but it's kind of like a harder game. And so it's so hard to make it in features or indie features that by the time you make it there, you're like, I made it there, and I made it there by being an asshole, kind of. Do you know what I mean? Like, when I had to go up against the big guys, and like, the only criticism I ever got on the studio side was you're too nice. Like, weirdly, like if you were a bigger jerk or if you'd wielded your power more, then you could have gotten a better result in this situation. And so then I feel like then women will come, directors come over to TV and they, that's what's helped them. Do you know what I mean? This Aggressive. kind of aggressiveness. Do you yeah, know what I mean? Yeah. It's made them heard and they've had to kind of, right. it's so hard out there to have your vision and your voice realize that you get in there and you're like, and that's your go-to tool set, you mm -hmm. know? So like when you get things, you're like, no, I've got to, because you've had to so aggressively defend, defend your territory and features, and everybody's like, whoa, what's wrong with her? Like, you know? Yeah, you have to understand the culture. That's <laughs> yeah, the thing. Exactly. If you're making that transition, yeah. really study the culture. Right. Yeah. And, and I think this person that we're, that we're talking about had no idea of what the culture was yeah. of, a, of a television set and, you know, what the dynamics were. And, you know, basically she, she just didn't know where the... She was she was sort of kissing up to the wrong people and in an obvious way and it, it was just all that stuff that was like you know you're trying to work this and you're working it all wrong because you you are misinformed that's all you just haven't done your homework. Well, I I want to say that I think that people get into shadow programs, me included, and in, there isn't a lot of information about how to be a yeah, shadow I mean, yeah, out right, there. No. And so I think it's good for that dialogue to happen because that politics there's politics involved in that. Absolutely, as well. yeah. I and had a totally oh, weird one. Because <laughs> I came from being a modern dance choreographer. I didn't know anyone in the film business at all. And this was back in the Stone Age when the American government sponsored the arts. What? I know. So I had been living overseas for 10 years. I'd been working in Paris and London. Yes, they actually cared about cross-cultural exchange. Then I went to Asia, <laughs> and I was living in Tokyo, and I was told a story by my kind of Japanese father that I knew I had to pass on, and I knew it wasn't dance. So if I hadn't met that guy in the coffee shop by chance, I would have never directed. So the, it haunted me, and I finally moved back to the States, and I made that short. You know, and it was everything, I should also add, it was everything I was told not to do if I wanted a job in Hollywood. Because, I mean, I was actively told not to make it. It was three quarters in Japanese. It had flashback narration. It was a period piece set in World War II. <laughs> and it had one white person in it. You know, and, but I didn't care. I was a dancer, who cares? You know, I am, I'm not looking for a job. I don't know anyone to get a job from. So I did this short, um, and I should also add, it was all Asian American actors, you know, uh, and they didn't speak Japanese, so I spoke the best Japanese of everyone on the set. <laughs> How weird is that? So I made this film, and it got nominated for an Academy Award, which is a total fluke of nature. So again, I think you that was a big piece of luck, and then it hasn't been easy, you know, I mean, you, you nobody has a free ride, right? But um, then the bottom line is, you know, you need some kind of talent, a lot of tenacity and a little bit of luck somewhere. There has to be that opening somewhere that you get that first opportunity, whatever the circumstance is. And you know, if you have the talent, you'll get that you'll get that opportunity. And if when you're you, tenacious enough. Yes, if yeah. you just hang in there, you'll get your opportunity. So you better have the talent, you better be ready. Right. And I think the good thing now is that if you haven't directed something in a long time, you can pick up a camera and do it. Yeah. We're, it's now a brave new world, and it's cheap, and you can get a 5D. You know, you can direct. Yeah, and you can find actors in this town. That's right. <laughs> you can, they're, they're everywhere. <laughs> and there's one more that you touched on, which I think this is, I think, critical, is there's a difference between tenacity and being a kiss-ass. Yes. Because yeah. there's something that I feel like it's, um, if you, the weird thing is, is like, so, like, now, if now I'm in a position to be a mentor, do you know what I mean? And then you give somebody the opportunity to come on the set. It's like you start. We started with respect. Do you know what I mean? Is to respect that relationship. There's nothing more aggravating than taking a chance on somebody, and then they come and they start schmoozing the actors and slipping them their script and like doing this. And you could just see it's just bald. Like their ambition is just bald, and they're That's climbing. And they're taking advantage of you, and it's naked, and everybody yeah. sees it, and it's embarrassing, and it's a bummer, yeah. you know. And yeah. then you. And then you squander that relationship. Where actually, and I feel like the the idea of 
being intuitive enough to respect everybody's role in the position. You know, and I'll tell people like flat out, like don't talk to the person. Don't do this. Don't something like somebody once was like, "Can I call for a friend some other person on and I was like, "No." And don't ask me that again. Like, like, I try to be really clear because you've spent years developing these relationships. Do you know what I mean? And they're your bread and butter. And if you, if you recommend somebody into this mm -hmm. and the people you recommend get burned, then it's on you. Do mm -hmm. you know what I mean? So you've got to kind of thoroughly vet and see, like, can you function in this world? <laughs> You know, in a way, <laughs> literally, and then sometimes you, they don't. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Sometimes they can't. You yeah. know. I would say also that it, whatever job that you're doing, if if you want to be, become a director and and you have some job in the business, make sure that you're doing that job as well as you possibly can do it. Um, also, um, yeah. make sure that you do everything you can to um, be able to direct su successfully. And I mean, take acting classes. Mm, good. Um, take um, improvisational cl classes. Um, learn the language. Read the books. Do everything you can possibly do. And pick up the camera and make, start making films. Yeah. I um, one of the, the other things I did to prove that I could direct uh, on the Shield was to make a couple of small films. And you know what? The f I did go to film school, but that was years ago, and they were just awful. Those films. Um, <laughs> and that was like, super eight, and I had no money. And yeah. Um, so I made these two little films, and I was say the first little film was so bad it was um, it was a first film I think there's there's often not not for everybody but there's I think for most people there's always the first film and you have to learn it's like get past it. Uh, yeah all the long pauses and you know overacting it's okay so then the second film was a little better but I would say do everything you can yeah yeah final advice wrapping up well an actor that the one I was talking about before who was crazy and I couldn't love him and still don't. <laughs> but he once said to me, um, I remember uh, um, we were, I think, filming on, at the USC campus and some students came up to him and said, and he was well known, he's an Academy Award winner, and said, um, you know, how do we be an actor? Do you have any advice for us? And he said, if you can think of anything else to do, do it. <laughs> but if you can't, don't. So I mean, if, you, if you can think of something else to do, then go do that. Yeah. And I think, so I, I always say to people who want to be writers or directors, if, if you can imagine, you know, your life doing something else, being a therapist, whatever it is, do that, you know, because it's, it's hard. But if you stick with it and if you have talent and a little bit of luck, then I think the world is open to you, you know, mm -hmm. eventually. Anybody else? Just remember that this, I would say, just remember this town is seventh grade. Okay. <laughs> it's like we live in seventh grade. Just accept it. It's really, you know, because talent, yes, is important, but, but seventh grade, you have to have more than talent. You have to be able to get along. You've got to make, to, just to make it work. It's all about relationships. And so you just, you do everything you can as authentically as you can it, to just get along and understand people. That's really what it boils down to, I think, in a lot of ways. That is actually so incredibly true. I have a seventh grader at home. I will go home at dinner and and share my problems with her, like, okay, you're living in middle school. How do we solve this? <laughs> I, I really and they're wise. They know. <laughs> but but the the other a, a piece of advice, the different a difference between features and television is if you're lucky on television, it goes on for years, and you are in relationships with executives and whomever for years. So you actually have to be honest. Uh, yeah. That would that would be my advice. Yes. You you cannot be lying to people. There is no time for them not to trust you. Yeah. So you actually you I, I think in features there there is certainly the cliche of it of you know the mouth is moving so they're lying. You cannot afford that in TV. You you have to so you have to be honest. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I would say for me, I think um, one of the differences, you know, we talk about women directors and, and maybe this is true of women writers, but in general, um, I think a lot of the path, I do think talent is clearly important, um, but there's a voice inside and there's instinct that you have. And I think that 
we don't, I know I didn't grow up with a sense of entitlement to express that voice. And so as, as esoteric and silly as it sounds, I'm still on that journey of like, I need to own who I am and bring who I am to the table. And that's part of the honesty. And mm -hmm. I think sometimes we're, we try to look to like, how do we please them? Yeah. How do we do that for them so that they'll like us? And I think sometimes as women, we suffer from that more often than men and I think that's that's the journey is to find out who you are what you can bring all the all the anything you've been through in life makes you who you are and I've come to realize that you know through years of doing this like no I'm entitled to have a voice and it's okay and again it's not personal because when you own who you are then every all the insanity around you isn't about you because you know you're okay and you know you're not a jerk and you know you're not a bitch or you know you're not whatever so you just let it fly around you and I think when you're comfortable with yourself people and confident people respond to that and I think only by directing and doing the work or making these little movies and working with actors you know one of the biggest fear people have is working with actors and writers too I think a lot of times they're afraid on set you know it's like but we're kind of fearless with that and working with actors just gives you confidence like no we're all just people and we can all communicate honestly and we're all there to trust and move forward something creative because we're all privileged to have this position. Right, and everyone has said such amazing things. And I think, again, trust your instincts. You know, the more you stay clued into your own instincts, whether it's meditating or whatever, because your instincts are so valuable, if you tell them to shut up, they will, and they won't talk to you anymore, you know, or at least about that thing. So I think, you know, owning who you are and playing well with others. And if they tell you no, then you know it's just not with them, it's with somebody else, so keep going. Right, right. No is so not no. No is is when you say it's enough, then it's enough, right. not when somebody tells you. And also, Elizabeth Taylor, when asked that question about, about you know, how do you make it, she said, the biggest piece of advice, take fountain. <laughs> <laughs> somebody told me that, I burst out laughing. Take fountain. <laughs> and, and I think part of it is, we, I realize how lucky we all are to be doing this. And, and it is a golden age of television right now, you know, and it's exciting that we're part of it, you know, and I do feel grateful. I feel grateful every day, even on a really bad day, you know, it's glad to hang in there, yeah. you know, make your movies, do well in the job you're doing, you know, make a tribe of people that you trust and make movies with them. Yeah. <laughs> you know, love your you're, craft, even yeah, if you're it. never yeah. successful in, in terms of the Hollywood idea of success, love your craft, love the art of it, be artists. First and foremost, you know, get in touch with that and hold on to that because that is what keeps you alive no matter what. Yeah. And if you do that, then the rest will come. I mm -hmm. definitely think so. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>